Now we go to the next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Avinash uh, Patel. He is coming from Max Planck Institute from in Dresden, and he will be talking about the phase transition in biology, a novel way to think about neuro regeneration. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me a chance to talk here about my work. But also, I would like to start off with a disclaimer, which is that in my entire talk, there would be nothing mentioned about nanomedicines or anything. So uh, just excuse me for that. But hopefully, I would be able to present to you an exciting, novel way of looking at neurodegeneration, which we have missed so far. So what do we know about neurodegeneration so far? As you can see in this slide, so what I am talking about are most of the neurodegenerative diseases that is linked with aggregation. So you can see here histopathological sections of patients that died. Uh, so that these are motor neuron histopathological um, uh, sections of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and uh, patients suffering with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and all were detected with some huge, horrendous aggregates in the uh, in the in the neurons. So one thing that I want to stress in this slide is that most of the neurodegenerative diseases have been uh, uh, found to be associated with prion, uh, sorry, uh, protein aggregates. And one characteristic of these kind of protein aggregates is that they are amyloids. Amyloids meaning it's a characteristic way of aggregation where just once the protein unfolds, it kind of forms these kind of structures with like cross beta sheet represented here in a very simplistic way. So about these neurodegenerative diseases, what we know is some, uh, and the current model, the way we think this happens is like this. So this is a cell, and these are the diffused biomolecules. Each of them is representing a protein here. So under uh, some genetic and environmental factors, they tend to form aggregates due to protein misfolding. And this is normally taken care by the cell in, with, with some disaggregases by autophagy or proteolysis. But what happens as we age and grow older, these machinery that basically has to solve this by pushing these aggregates back to the normal diffuse state is, becomes le weaker and weaker. And what we end up is this irreversible aggregates in forms of amyloids, such this, which gives us these diseases. So now, let's now take a closer look at the proteins that tend to aggregate in these diseases. And all of these proteins that tend to aggregate fall into the class of proteins known as intrinsically disordered proteins. So what do I mean by intrinsically disordered proteins is something like this. So most of the proteins normally fold into a very nice three-dimensional shape. But these proteins actually have a good, have a domain or a part of the protein that can fold to a characteristic three-dimensional fold. But what happens is that it has a domain that is very less complex, which, is, which means that the composition of the amino acid that makes the domain is fairly less complex that doesn't allow the protein to fold into a three-dimensional shape, making it an unstructured, low complexity prion-like domain. So what I mean by prion-like domain and all that, if you want to uh, talk about specific proteins, we can have a discussion later, but in interest of time, I will be skipping explaining some of those terms. So what do we know about intrinsically disordered proteins is that they, are, they have a low complexity domain, and most of them have a characteristic domain that can bind RNA or single standard DNA. So what that allows these proteins to do is basically it can bind RNA and something like that, and can also interact within themselves. And with this protein-protein interaction or protein-nucleotide interaction, as you can see here. And from this literature, we know that these proteins then can localize or form a non-membrane bound compartment. So what is a non-membrane bound compartment now inside a cell? So we most of us know about membrane bound compartments like Golgi apparatus or uh, electro, uh, sorry, endoplasmic reticulum, but non-membrane compartments are something like this. As you can see, they are not surrounded. These are compartments that the cell form inside the cytoplasm, but they are not surrounded by any kind of membranes. Some examples are shown here, which are some granules in a worm called C. elegans that they form, and then they form and disappear. Nucleoli is a classic example inside the nucleolus. It's not surrounded by any membrane. 
and also some kind of granules that a cell forms, which are called stress granules. So what these non-membrane bond compartments are characterized by is, and makes, and what makes them different from membrane bond compartments is that they have, can, they can be characterized by dynamic shape changes. Also, they are known to concentrate proteins for biochemical reactions, and thirdly, they have been shown to form by a process called liquid-liquid demixing or phase separation. So what do I mean by liquid-liquid demixing or phase separation? Let's take a classic example. For example, when you are making a vinaigrette for your salad, what you do is that you take olive oil and you take vinegar and you mix them. And let's say, for example, you use it for your salad and then you forget about it. And you, when you come back and see what happens to it, you see something like this where the vinegar separates out and from droplets in olive oil. So this is a classic case of phase separation. They are two liquids. They can't mix with each other. So what they do is that they, the, the vinegar phase separates and forms this kind of liquid droplets. So the non-membrane bound compartments that I just spoke about have been shown to form by a process of phase separation. So, so far what I have told you is, is again coming back to the model. The diffused IDPs, so now from now on, the intrinsically disordered proteins, I, would be, I was referring like IDPs, they uh, can localize and form non-membrane bond compartments which have been shown to form liquid, uh, which, which have been uh, shown to form liquid-like, uh, have liquid-like properties. And also what I showed is that these diffused IDPs have been shown to form irreversible aggregates in this disease. So this forms the background of my study now, so the two hypotheses that we came up with this. So could it be that the IDPs actually form a liquid-like compartment under physiological conditions in a cell that is responsible for its role in a healthy cell? But what happens in a disease that this liquid-like state undergoes a phase transition which is not normal for it. So it undergoes an aberrant phase transition to form solid-like aggregates. In order to test these two hypotheses, we had to come up with a, with a disease to look at. And the disease we chose is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And the reason we chose this is a protein called FUS, which is fused in sarcoma, which is a classical IDP, has been shown uh, to, to uh, form aggregates in the ALS patients. In a normal state, it's in the nucleus, as you can see here. This is a histopathological uh, slice again. It's nicely localized in the nucleus, and uh, uh, in a disease patient, what happens is that there is nothing inside the nucleus. Everything is outside in the cytoplasm in form of the aggregates. So ALS is normally characterized by these irreversible fuzz cytoplasmic aggregates. So we started off first by looking at, so we made cells that expresses fuzz and see what do we see, because these are histopathological sections. So here you see, a HeLa cell, which is a cancer cell, expressing fuzz, which has been tagged by a fluorophore, GFP. And in a normal state, you see that everything, this is the nucleus, everything is inside the nucleus, and uh, it plays a role in transcription and splicing. But when you introduce some kind of a stress to the cell, which is heat stress in this condition, what happens is that most of these fuzz rushes out to the cytoplasm and forms these kind of compartments. So, and once the stress has been taken care of, these droplets, uh, sorry, or these compartments redissolve and rush back to the nucleus. So FUS forms reversible compartments in healthy cells. So the first question we ask then, that these compartments that we see inside the cell, are they liquid-like? Do ha they have liquid-like properties? And in order to do that, I took an in vitro approach where I purified the protein and reconstituted these compartments in a test tube. And that you see here. So this is the protein. I, I purified it and I reconstituted them. These are also tagged with uh, GFP. And you're looking at uh, the uh, so reconstituted fuzz compartments down a microscope by fluorescence microscopy. And you see these kind of droplets. And what happens here is that if you see in time, they form exactly like they behave like liquids, which is what you would expect by liquid drops, that they fuse and become a bigger droplet. So what I'm sh showing here is that first, be first droplets behave like liquids, what is expected from, from them. If they are liquids, so do they behave, do they have some other characteristics of the liquids, which they do, they, do they drip, do they flow? This is exactly like when you 
pour honey from uh, from your spoon like the way it flows can it can it flow and as you can see here nicely if you apply stress on a droplet of fuzz it flows like you expect it from a liquid drop this shows that the fuzz droplets drip like a liquid you are expected by, from a liquid so it brings to the conclusion of the first part of my talk which is fuzz in a normal condition has liquid like properties and we showed this in a cell as well. In the interest of time, I'm not showing the data that we uh, showed inside the cell. So that brings me back to our second hypothesis, which is in disease, the liquid-like state undergoes an aberrant phase transition to form a solid-like aggregate. And in order to, and in order to uh, test this hypothesis, we asked the questions. There are several mutations that has been linked with the patients in ALS. So if we take those mutations, do we say, uh, see something uh, like, uh, can we reconstitute the pathological state of FUS? So for that, we took the advantage of several mutations that has been linked with ALS. And, but I would be showing, and uh, we got similar results for many of the mutations that we tried. But I'm going to show you the data for just one uh, single mutation this is, that is mentioned here. So when I reconstituted this protein, what I saw is exactly like you would expect with the wild type fuzz here. So this is the wild type, this is the drops that you saw before, and with the mutants as well, you saw the same thing when I looked at them. But one thing that came to my mind at that moment, so this was a disappointing result in the, in the beginning that you know they formed the same, I couldn't see anything else, but one thing that happens is that ALS or any kind of neurodegenerative diseases doesn't happen when you are young. You only get them when you age, so I thought, could there be something different if I can age these droplets? What could I see? And that's why I came up with a in, like an essay, which, is called, which I call as in vitro aging. And what you see is that when you look at them over time, the wild type fuzz would fuse and become bigger, as you would expect from a classical droplet. But in, instead, the mutant starts to develop some kind of funny structures. And by the end of eight hours, what you would see is that the mutant has completely converted, converted into this horrendous fibrous aggregates, but the wild type doesn't. So the conclusion we drew from this and several other experiments that we did is that the mutants, what they did is that they make the phase transition, which is a liquid to a solid phase transition, much, much faster than you expect from a wild type protein. Having said this, I would say that the wild type protein also ages and becomes, becomes this, but after 24 hours. So at, after a very, very long time. So then we started looking at if are these droplets, what happens if, if it's a phase transition? Could we see that the fibers, uh, the droplets give rise to the fibers or something? As you can see here, if you look at a droplet over time, so the fibers grow out from the droplet, which means, and then they, they convert into something like a starburst, so which means that the first droplet serves as a localized center for the initiation of aging or initiation of the fibers. So that brings to my uh, almost final slide, which is that FUS undergoes a liquid to solid phase transition that could explain us how the disease occurs. And many other labs also after us found the same thing that even science ran a story news, which means that the protein drops may seed brain disease. So what I'm finishing off with saying is that currently we always think that this happens through this, which is the IDPs go into the aggregates, which is taken care of by the cell, and then it forms uh, ages to form these irreversible aggregates. What I'm, I'm trying to say here is that something like this might be happening, whereas the IDPs form these, by phase separation, these liquid-like compartments, that, the, that is much more easier for the cell to move back to these kind of uh, dissolved state. But as we age, of course, these are not going back to that. So what happens is that they age and start forming the irreversible aggregates. So currently, most of our uh, targeting of the medicine is focused towards this aggregates. But what I would like to say is that we should also keep in mind that's the intermediate phase that we could target. And with that, I would like to finish my talk by thanking my lab and uh, my boss, basically. And thank you all for listening. And I'm Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting talk. And I think uh, uh, it's a paper in cell, so you have simplified your data to really bring to this audience. Thank you very much. Please, uh, the study is now open for questions. 
Um, thank you for the in interesting talks and concept. Um, where would, I mean, a number of these neurodegenerative diseases, the uh, one species, one protein species, which is thought to be quite relevant, both for toxicity and ag further aggregation, are oligomeric structures. So where would they fit in, in, in your model? So the model is basically, what happens is that most, as I said, most of these proteins that form oligomers have this kind of uh, a tendency to phase separate into liquid-like droplets. So that's what I'm saying. As, and and in, the, in this phase separate liquid-like droplet, the protein concentration is much higher than the cytoplasm. So you would imagine a cytoplasm is a very complex, crowded environment. So one molecule to find another molecule is pretty difficult. But if it is in this phase separated droplet, one molecule which is that, that has a tendency to form oligomer is much more closer to another molecule. So that was increases the tendency to aggregate. And many, so, so we, I just focused on fuzz here, but now our lab is looking into many other, like alpha synuclein, tau, uh, just name it alpha, beta, A, beta, right? And most of them have a tendency to form these kind of phase separated uh, uh, compartments or droplets. I think uh, we just move on. I have some questions, but I think I will discuss later on. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we thank uh, the speaker again. Now we move.